Yeah, welcome to our webinar, uh, Mastering Kubernetes in a Multi-Cloud World. Uh, and it's not just mastering, it's also securing. So that's here. Um, my name is Toby. I'm from Kubernetes. I'm working there since six years as a principal architect. I have a Java background, then over Java I come to the containers 10 years ago and then eight years ago to Kubernetes and help um, customers on their journey to the cloud native world. And here is as well one Tobias from Akko. Yeah, Tobias Gerhard, uh, as we already had it in the pre-works for the webinar. If you have questions to me, maybe just uh, write it in the chat as Gerhard. It's easier to distinguish, I guess, to, for everyone. Um, I'm two years with Aqua Security as a solution architect there for all the technical stuff that might be of interest for yeah prospects and others wanting to know what Aqua is all about, especially when they come from the open source world. Yeah, I'm not as developer focused as Tobias from Kubermatic, but now also with yeah six years of experience in the field of DevOps or DevSecOps. Awesome. Cool, then um, let's get started. So basically first, before we're going really in multi-cloud, I want to recap a little bit what is basic cloud native about or what at least was the promise of cloud native. So I think often we may forget why we're doing that and why we changed in regards from traditional VMs or application service to kind of Kubernetes deployment. And I think one of the reasons was that we recognize that we have a lot of our resources spending into maintain and or keep things operated and not innovative uh, task and keep like, the current release update, um, make the next release upgrade, make it safe and every release patch uh, was quite critical and a lot of people were spending their time on it and also the um, amount of people who are, are available in the IT didn't match anymore the scale of applications. So if you compare it like 10 years ago, one person needed to manage maybe 10 applications. Now one people may need to manage 100 or above of the application. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we went into um here cloud native and here um basically we want to like rebalance this shape between maintenance innovation focus on more innovation reduce also like logins so containers are great to move logins because containers you can run basically with kubernetes in the cloud on premise with your own solution with solutions are like ours or hosted ones from the public cloud providers. And this comes to more um, like a split that you can kind of concentrate on the application side on your application development and then uh, on uh, innovating new features and operations hopefully as much as possible automated. And for this automation, we brought in Kubernetes. Now, um, we are scaling now. So we see a lot of customers now who are scaling up in clusters. So they started maybe five years ago with one, two uh, Kubernetes clusters, now getting like 50 to 100 and this will co continue. And uh, the reason is basically, um, okay, we need to change the light. <laughs> um, and the reason is basically why Kubernetes, Kubernetes, um, this basically the division portable, extensible. And for me, it's real, uh, one of the most uh, important point is open source. So you can extend it to your needs. You can make it like small for edge deployments, can use it for large scale server deployments, and uh, you can automate on top of Kubernetes. And um, basically the core principle of is uh, we have declarative configuration, we have controllers and controllers try to reach the state in your infrastructure. And that's basically giving you then a platform. Basically, this platform relies on any kind of hardware. Um, with the hardware layer here, uh, you basically have an abstraction layer of infrastructure, maybe a virtualization like on the public hyperscalers or using bare metal or using some new fancy tools like Qvert where you make KVM machines in your bare metal cluster. And then on top, you have kind of a platform layer, what could be like our KKP platform or some Kubernetes platform on the public hosters. And top of Kubernetes, you are installing something like Knative or Istio, what using 
other applications engineer for getting, for example, certificates or getting secured um, multi-factor authentication stuff and something like that. So that's something um, where how our platforms is built up. And now um, we see now that kind of Kubernetes is recognized as cloud operating system. You see, hey, do you run on Kubernetes often now on an application description? And you have really see that Kubernetes is kind of a standard abstraction layer. And this abstraction layer is very important. It's basically based on the API. So everything what you have in Kubernetes network storage and community resources abstracted by API. So I can, can send you a storage example in the same way in my open uh, in my bare metal center as I would do it in the cloud at Google, and that's pretty cool. Um, that's also the case where we started in going into DevOps. So in, in DevOps, you having a specification what's off in this YAML spec, what's talking with the Kubernetes API, and say, hey, please reach this state. And that's often kind of the core principle what I used in, in GitOps to say, okay, I uh, commit my things in a Git repository to receive the diffs um, to reach, okay, every change is tracked and every change can revert it. Uh, but you also, to do this, you need something what representing this in kind of infrastructure this company is giving. And uh, that's basically, I think, the success factor why Kubernetes is all about. And variation. So similar, I would say, as Jenkins, you can modify Kubernetes in various ways what is good because you have the same API centralized, uh, maybe a little bit better as it was as Jenkins. Um, and then uh, you can use uh, still a variation of cloud providers. For example, the Google Cloud could give there the Google storage with some dedicated features, what you may not have on premise. And yeah, but now we came to the point how we can scale that. So basically, you know, multi-cloud, you have maybe uh, applications needs to run on premise because you're an industry company where your uh, production line is relying on applications what's be on site, and maybe you don't want to have the transit cost of data between data centers or clouds, and so you're coming in a multi cloud world. How, I, like in our know, enterprise, um, such a structure from the IT perspective could look like is you basically have maybe multiple data centers. Every data center has the infrastructure layer for uh, CPU and memory and uh, compute power, and you have storages, and then often you have kind of backend services like databases, analytic services, or observability services. And then you have kind of multiple IT teams who develop an app services or buying in app service or controlling external people to create app services, and these are consuming then the backend services. And um, we maybe have edge. So we have maybe a production line where we have real-time data, what I need to collect, or we have a uh, kind of data, what coming in from, um, yeah, from services around the world, what is not in the edge, but maybe from client devices as a mobile phone or something like that. That's often came in. Um, and we have cloud providers. What are good in services providing like you have um, AI services or you have denial of service protection services or you have other special managed services or you have a, like a cache network where you, you have your CDN network where you exposing your application or global scale. That's something what's often then used cloud for. And all of that somehow get, needs to get managed from an operational perspective. And we think that basically every individual team need also the individual environment because you only be effective if you can build your environment or use your environment as you are effective in. Um, you, you know it from your laptop. If you may switching from one operating system to another operating system, it takes you slowing you down, it takes your time. And that's the same in infrastructure. And that's why you need maybe different infrastructure but still managed um, and how we can do this and scale. And I think therefore it's Kubernetes is a perfect product because in with, uh, Kubernetes you can everywhere have the same standard for running databases, for running applications or for running also on the edge. So basically I can run a mini like work uh, nodes on the edge device, collecting the data with some um, data shippers 
pushing into the uh, to the IT space over some APK, API layer, doing some magic and storing it in the backend services. And this is basically, I think, where we all developing into that we have kind of a unique um, ecosystem, what we're talking often with uh, Kubernetes, and then we have dedicated use cases behind it. And therefore, uh, we, we um, for the scope to managing that, we created our Kubernetes platform. Um, and basically, are we managing Kubernetes in Kubernetes? So we have basically used the same principle for Kubernetes managing applications, the same principle we're using for managing clusters. And um, that's basically abstracting here, um, not the dedicated infrastructures, that's the uh, task of Kubernetes, we abstracting then the cloud providers. So it should not feel a difference if I provision a Kubernetes cluster into my VM vSphere, or I provision it on the Google Cloud, or maybe do some not as famous uh, um, local providers as heads in the cloud, for example. And this um, we abstracted, and then we are supporting multiple operating systems like CentOS, Ubuntu. I think there's Rocky Linux is also supported, it's missing here. Um, we have quite some more. And on top of that, we are creating Kubernetes. And um, Kubernetes clusters are not just Kubernetes clusters. Kubernetes clusters I have a little bit of flavors, and we uh, starting from a vanilla cluster and having then pre-defined pre configuration options where you can include what you want. As example, you have an identity management, you want to have it everywhere the same. You don't want to have different identities in, identities in AWS as in Azure. Um, same for monitoring logging. We have the standard stack based on the uh, well-known open source tools, Prometheus, Loki, and Grafana. We are getting multi-cloud, multi-tenant, multi-tenant logging infrastructure. Additional to that, um, you have some cost controlling aspects like metering or cost optimization with cluster auto-scaling, um, also like detection or, um, of how much capacity you have and uh, where, what are your limits. But we will see later in the, in the demo part of the webinar. Um, how is our architect looks like? Basically, we're starting here on the top with a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, what is our management cluster? This is often called in our case master cluster. This master cluster is basically just a Kubernetes cluster. We uh, installing then with Cube One. Cube One is like a single cluster management tooling, but we need kind of a first Kubernetes cluster running. This is uh, could be placed everywhere. You can place it in the cloud, on premise, wherever you want, and then. We installing on the on the platform what is a set of operators and basically we then create in projects and every project can have n clusters and there the cl uh, cluster operator creates a cluster what has a containerized control plane and here the containerized control plane is really cool because it's really fast and it's deterministic so we have every time the same state um, as you know from applications, the same belongs here for Kubernetes. And these Kubernetes components are running here containerized and creating them with the cluster API components, workload nodes in the dedicated target cloud. And the workload nodes have like a callback to the management layer and um, where they're connecting to. So you have also from a network perspective, really less entry points to get connected. And um, this workers could not, should could but must not be at the same cloud. So basically, you can you run you run your management on premise and workers in the cloud, or the vice versa, or on different clouds. So you can manage with one management cluster multiple clouds. Why are we running containerized uh, applications um, or uh, containerized control planes? Is the same what applies to. Uh, uh, applications. If you're hosting a lot of them, you can save a lot of resources. For example, if you want to save, uh, if you want to run 100 clusters in your organizations, basically, normally, if you have a VM based setup, you would need for each control plane in HA's uh, node. So you have three nodes uh, with each two CPUs, we run, uh, we're ending in 600 CPUs. If you want to run it with us, you need containers, and the containers have a less footprint, and you need to not to reserve the scale-out. The scale-out reservation is done by the Kubernetes cluster. And that brings you then to the, um, like, to 30 CPUs for the same quality of HA. So you're saving a, a factor 20 of your resources already in the data center or in the cloud for hosting only the control planes. This is quite cool. Um, 
then you can extend it kind through a really global scale approach. Basically, you have a master cluster here running somewhere in a core data center, and then you're spreading out the management cluster in so-called C cluster. So you extracting one part to a so-called C cluster, and the C cluster is the only way, uh, um, component what is connected, in, for example, to your Nutanix or your local QWERTY cluster, where you can then create their, their worker nodes directly there and uh, creating there your on-site applications or what applications you want. Then maybe you have another location what's more like a production line. There yeah, you want to have an edge cluster what basically are transferring data over Kafka or something like that. Or you're having another data center where you only have a vSphere available and nothing else, you can run there as well. And the so seed clusters uh, could be like one in US, one in U, and so on. Um, this could look like that. So we have a master cluster that's managing basically a whole uh, meta management. Then we have maybe workers who are close to the master uh, clusters in our own data centers. They can connect it here directly over uh, the, into the master cluster. Then we have on-premise data center, which should be um, controlled by itself. So you can also partly control it. And there the worker nodes are on the region uh, where the data center is. And for example, for the EU, we want to have um, some different cloud clusters, one in the data center of Toulouse, one in the data center maybe in Berlin, and they can use one shared uh, regional cluster uh, for, for the management. And that's bringing you up to really on scale. And how you can scale the security level, um, now uh, the other Tobias <laughs> will take, a, take over. <laughs> Yeah, you just need to give me the share or stop the share uh, beforehand. Uh, <laughs> so here we go. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, yeah, we thought like, hmm, if we have, when the first uh, first time when we had this, because uh, a mutual customer brought this to us, I was like, Tobias explaining it to me. And I thought, okay, this is like a Kubernetes cluster everywhere. There's a cluster, there's a cluster. And then you have hundreds and hundreds of all. And the good point is, from an Aqua perspective, we thought, yeah, why might this be a problem? Okay, from the first overview, we are already the provider for hybrid multi-cloud environments when it comes to uh, such complex things. Regardless of if you want to have it as a SaaS um, version to consume our software, or if you want to build the software or include the software entirely in your Kubernetes setup, what you have foreseen on a global scale, then maybe, or European-wide, whatever it might be in the, in the meantime. And what we bring into this is, as soon as you start, you are able with Aqua to control everything that comes from the shift left, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with us, and securing everything that comes prior, as well as bringing then the, our unique runtime security features into each environment. And as we are supporting any kind of cloud provider, you could extend us also to secure the underlying infrastructures, as uh, Tobias from Kubernetes mentioned, that you obviously can use for the scale out the resources from AWS, Azure, and GCP, we could also give you insights around your cloud accounts that are uh, below the level of Kubernetes, or if you are a more yeah, on-premise or sensitive customer enterprise, whatever it might be, you could also say that, okay, I have my tools in place, but I have nothing in place to control this mixture and cluster pop-up coming with the scalability uh, options and possibility I gain from Kubernetes, and therefore I maybe want to include Aqua exactly into those Kubernetes clusters directly. And when you include us in a cluster, we could be there to say, hey, everything that comes from a code base and using then our supply chain security module, if you want to do this, could help you in determining risks before they're actually arriving but I'm not going to focus that much in this webinar on it because I'm more on the track here to say that, yeah, when it comes to the build phase, as of course, you could also include your build systems in the Kubernetes cluster for your CSD and other parts of it. We want to focus more on the runtime side and say that, hey, if you included Aqua 
in a Kubernetes cluster, then Aqua is there to help you on all the yeah, new threats, new kinds of attack vectors that you have with the cloud native world. So this is also coming then with our agent-based solution, obviously, as from technical side, of course, you cannot have the best of breed uh, runtime protection if you are not there to really protect and not and prevent and not only yeah, alarm or something like that. That is not the level what we can just do. We are, for all the pillars that you can see here, we are able to also protect the environments regardless where you have spun them up. And all in all, this sums up to uh, what you see here, that we are there to keep the bed out directly before it arrives at maybe one of the seed clusters because you want to instantiate their new service. Or if you just copy something from left to right or from a testing environment towards your upstream cloud-based production cluster then at the end. At all pillars, we can be used to apply certain gates and then with the gates define and um, provide the security posture and the compliance regulations that you need for your business. And all in all the benefits, we give you the visibility that you know exactly in which cluster, if it's a C cluster, if it's something of a regional, if it's just a user space and so on, we can give you the visibility. We are therefore here to reduce the risks of getting something unknown maybe, then be affected by whatever it might be in the future. And you can always use the data from Aqua to prove your compliance and say that, hey, even though we are able to provide the self-service and with the self-service, you can spin up whole infrastructure and Kubernetes cluster, we can always give the insurance that everything inside of it is adhering to the standards and the best practices that we want to use in our company. And how this looks like is uh, basically you could use the Aqua software as a service solution and then say, okay, I just installed the necessary details in all of my user clusters. You could, of course, looking at the slide here, also include the management network layer and then the Kube, uh, the Cube One or the Kubernetes platform on the, on the left-hand side. But in this yeah, example deployment, we were just focusing on that it's regardless where you spin up your tenants. And again, this can be in your local data center. This can be in any public cloud provider. This could be also one of the yeah, lower level or local providers as to be as mentioned with Hetzner and others that you can always implement the same security level and the security posture for those um, setups. And on the other side, this is also the demo setup that we've uh, created and which uh, Tobias will just show it uh, to you. We were also thinking that maybe it is for a good reason that you want to use something like Kubernetes to keep the management and the control in one of your on-premise data centers and not leave it to a public cloud provider to say, yeah, here's all my management and I use uh, the public cloud provider as the single point of configuration, if you want to call it like that. And Hence, it's obviously possible to use Aqua and the runtime functionalities as well as the scanning capabilities for images as an on-premise version and just deploy it as it's uh, yeah, located here inside the management network, just on the side of it or also inside of the Cube One Kubernetes platform and then connect everything that you have on a regional level or even on a global scale level, depending then obviously on your on-premise network capabilities towards one central self-managed, self-owned uh, Aqua installation and um, use this approach. And on a global scale, this is what we've also covered in here. You could also say that hey, maybe I want to use the cloud services because I need to scale out. I want to scale out. I want to use some specific services from them. All fine. But you have, on the other hand, as Tobias also mentioned, some critical workloads maybe that you have to rely on that they live on premise. And then you could also go into a hybrid environment that for every dedicated independent setup could give you the possibility to have it in one central Aqua console again. But then also for the scale out portions, you could use the cloud services at the end and then also the regional 
uh, SaaS versions that we offer from an aqua security perspective, say that, okay, those are less sensitive, but I still want to keep all of the less sensitive stuff in another second, but only second, console and management overview. And therefore, I want to use the SaaS service from Aqua in addition to the on-premise uh, console that controls all the regulated environments. And yeah, as you can see, everything of this is supportable by Aqua. And therefore, you could. we were thinking of giving you just one slide now here and placing everywhere gates that you could block it here, block it there, and so on and so forth. But obviously, we want to keep it short, crispy, and simple. And security is not here to block you, or especially if some developers are listening, to block you from the actual work. But it's always the possibility that you gain, as well as, of course, as I mentioned, the visibility into the stuff that is going on in the Kubernetes world if you establish such a global scale setup. Now, from a demo perspective, I would uh, give it shortly back to Tobias from Kubernetes for the first point, because he will show to you how you can implement Aqua now in the Kubernetes cluster, as we also established to make use of the unique Kubernetes applications. Exactly. So let me share. Uh, I think you can see now my screen. Um, basically, when we start with a um, KKP installation, we're installing everything where you want. And then you basically getting a management API and UI. So what is important, everything what you see on the UI is also available over API. So you can also automate it in the same way in a GitOps principle, uh, what helps you to really build your based on your needs. What first? Um, so as we are multi-tenant solution, uh, we will sign in. So basically in my setup, I have signed in options over Google GitHub or external email. Um, and then um, if I logged in, I first will see a list of projects. So basically here um, we have a list of projects. What is here in um, like we have the Aqua security uh, for this webinar and we have maybe some other things for the process um, purpose. And as I'm a super admin for the whole platform, I can see a lot of more projects and every project can, I can, can manage and can do. Um, just to be clear, one project in our case holding and clusters and every project has kind of a quota. So we see it here over different clouds. We have a quota here from, 20, uh, from 30 CPUs and 100 gig of memory. And we have a disk space of 500 gigabyte, so what we restricted us. And there are a few clusters are running. So basically you have a cluster NopusTech, AWS, Azure, and KubeWord. So KubeWord, who does not know it, is basically a KVM virtualizer, what is cloud native and used um, in bare metal scenario. So basically you're providing a bare metal Kubernetes cluster, installing KubeWord, and then you can creating VMs on it. And we're using this VMs to creating Kubernetes cluster out of it and slicing, so sizing directly in kind of a on-premise environment, multiple multi-tenant isolated Kubernetes clusters into it. And you can also manage traditional VMs about it, but that would be a different topic for a separate webinar. In our case, um, now we have a few services. Uh, so we have a, a Aqua Central service where we deployed Aqua Dashboard. And I will now show you how we could set up like on scratch such a service and uh, could place it where you want. So basically the clusters are just you define where you want to have the workload. Often it's clear you want to have the workload there where your data is because data transfer costs are expensive um, or you where your services. For example, if you're using maybe some fancy AI service, you want to go to Azure or AWS. If you may want to go to, uh, hey, I have a super data pipeline, I may using uh, Google Big Data or something like that. Uh, and that's something what you have the freedom of choice. Um, so let's get started. Um, in KKP, we have different resources. So we have clusters, uh, we have external clusters, what are basically clusters what we can import from the hyperscalers. And we have Cube one clusters. This could be a standalone cluster, for example, the use cases there when I have like a one single instance cluster somewhere around the world and I don't want to get it 
attached to central management in a complete uh, containerized throttling world, I can stand alone cluster manage there. Um, and we have automated backups, so etcd backups and cluster backups for applications and access levels where you can select who has access. Here, for example, I gave uh, Tobias access, so get, he can also manage the clusters in this project and uh, managing also that um, together. So therefore, um, let's go to the clusters uh, templates because this uh, section is quite cool because basically everything uh, how I a configure cluster can store as a template. And I can predefine, for example, also an Aqua server uh, cluster or a workload cluster, what includes then the Aqua uh, um, enforcer. Or um, it's not configured right now, but it's possible to say, hey, every cluster should get the Aqua en uh, enforcer. And I can then configure, okay, every cluster in this data center should get enforced by this um, um, enforcer. And then you're getting basically like governance on top of it. So you basically decide you can configure maybe the CNI and where you deploy, but uh, Aqua enforces is ensured that they are installed and you cannot delete them. Okay, so now um, for this, I would show us the Google Cloud demo. So let's search for GC, GC, GCP. Uh, maybe it's here. Uh, Google Cloud, yeah, GPC. So I want to create this MLA. So MLA stands for Monitoring, Logging, Alerting. I can start here creating a cluster using the template and say, oh, I want to add a Aqua server and uh, enforce it to this cluster so I can customize my template. So um, then let's say um, it's the well, demo, um, maybe now. Server, I can choose what versions I want to have of Kubernetes. This is also something what you manage by yourself. If a new bug fix release is coming, you can just add it by configuration. You don't need to release from us. So let's keep it for this version. And we have then also the option to choose with some different CNIs. You can use the built in CDM or the kernel, or you bring your own. And uh, we can configure their different network configuration stuff if we want to. In this case, we don't want to. Uh, I can add SSH, but I don't need to provision it. It's just like for maybe uh, I want to add it later or something like to debugging or for other stuff. I can get access to the nodes if I want to. Um, other features, for example, audit logging, I can get my uh, recommendation value, what I can add, configure the backend, and I can enable cluster backup, what do I don't need for now, and say, okay, this is kind of a, um, Aqua server cluster. So I can filter in the backend also for this labels in cost centers or in our metering, and I get this cost uh, directly exported here. Then I have uh, the next thing or uh, what I can customize is I do I want what account one I use. For that, we have here a preset. Uh, this preset is basically the service account and the network where I want to deploy it. And this pre-configured nice thing is that as an end user, I can create clusters without having the credentials of the de dedicated target environment. So then uh, let's create basically this cluster and giving the machine some settings. So that's already pre-configured um, uh, in my in my preset, but I want to give in a little bit more power and I say Aqua nodes. Um, I choosing flat car and I say I want to have um, a little bit more RAM and CPU. So we taking the standard standard four is maybe too much. This was N standard two. This is fine. And I using preemptible nodes, so I getting preemptible prices, what is nice. As this is not persistent, that's fine. I also can apply auto scaling if I want to, and um, taints and so on. Um, and then now we came into the application section. Basically, the application side says, okay, what I want to show is here. Um, we have the Aqua, let's see here, right in the top, different projects of Aqua, um, and we have the Aqua server what getting their a version. So currently we do using the latest 2024 and uh, let's figure a namespace and I can then configure what I want to set. 
Herefore, I can um, add my values to get uh, here my Aqua server deployed. Let's expect this could be also on-premise or wherever you want. And then uh, storing the setting, and I say, I just not want to have the server. I also want to have the enforcer. And I can spec the enforcer and say, okay, please, I want to have the enforcer. Uh, and I adding here um, the enforcer in the part here, what is important is the gateway. So here the gateway is cluster internal. So I use the cluster internal namespace a service and, and that the enforcer communicate over this gRPC uh, protocol server, um, gateway server to the Aqua Central. Um, then I have this kind of ready. I see, okay, what I want to create a Google Cloud cluster with this um, type of service. And after the the class is created, I want to ensure I have my Aqua standalone system. And this I can now save as a new template. And this template, I can say, okay, it's only for this project uh, stored Aqua uh, send alone demo. And then I can create as much of possible clusters of it. So I have now here uh, Aqua, you know, Oh, you misspelled A A A U Q. Oh, thanks. Sorry for that. <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, okay, then uh, cluster would now get created, but I can now create a lot of them uh, just by click and, and by creating a new cluster. So this cluster will take it now two to five minutes. What happens now is we have the API server control planes. What I get containerized, in this case, the management layer is really on-premise and the work is getting created on the Google Cloud. You can think about uh, like Antos plus turnaround. <laughs> so Antos mostly managed in the cloud on-premise resource. We do it another way around, just an option. And then are we getting machine deployments, which basically are the nodes. And when the nodes are ready, uh, we installing the applications and the applications when are installed, giving you the full Aqua control plane. To, in respect of the time, I switching to do my backup cluster. So uh, I think later on, uh, Tobias will show that the cluster came up. Um, we have their similar setup in, in AWS, install the applications, and we have the enforcer in the server. What in the end is then visible, and that's my hand over to, to Tobias, in our cluster, um, where we have here uh, basically two components. Aqua Sec Server, we see a workload. We have basically a deployment. It's cloud native stuff, um, deployments, jobs, ports running. What are giving me then the UI? And here I can go to the service, and this is I, what I can still do. Hopefully, um, it's administrator, and we have the password. Um, defined in the application what we want to use. And then we can log in and see, uh, I was too slow. Expired, okay. Oh, you were just now too fast to spin up the, let the database spin up in the backend. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, but could be, but, it, but you were Nothing like that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. you see, I'm on the Aqua dashboard, and um, uh, that's the same. Um, and there we have another thing: is the, uh, the enforcers. So the enforcer are basically here uh, a daemon set, what running then on every node to enforcing basically uh, what gets run on the route, inspecting it, and uh, doing the magic security stuff. Okay, then I think I can switch over to. Yeah, you can. Just so, share. let's stop and you can share. <laughs> exactly. So what we have then at the end established, and this is, as I said, also focusing again on the on-premise world of Aqua. So this is the workload protection suit that you get at the end when the installation finished and everything is spun up. And here you have then the full visibility also in terms of the uh, risk explorer, especially to say that, hey, which cluster is now the one that I want to take care of, which workloads are located, 
uh, alongside everything, what is maybe also the communication flow that is ongoing, what are the criticalities in deployments that I have in place, uh, which are the hosts that they are running on, what is the image uh, all about that the container is based upon, and so on and so forth. And of course, we wanted to bring in also another buzzword to this demo. Therefore, we also had something around the, yeah, AI portion at the end. <laughs> and this is why in the cluster, going back to uh, the Kubernetes dashboard for Kubernetes, we have some service running and just going to it. This is a little nice implementation of AI. Uh, the application can tell you normally, hey, what is my stock price for Google as a quite nice example. And not talking about the shift left aspects and so on and so forth, because you could also say that, hey, I'm not in my uh, in my enterprise, I'm not the guy developing such AI features. Maybe I just want to consume that from an external contractor for some HR tasks or for some other internal um, activities. Obviously, not always to reveal the nicest uh, stock prices or the newest or build some logic around it. But it stands for the same principles that with the enforcers and the runtime capabilities that you have, you could maybe fetch also misbehaving functionalities like this, where we could maybe try to ask the AI something different that it's normally not appearing to. So this already looks a bit su suspicious that they can get some information out of it. Maybe we could already do something, something else. Maybe this won't work. Now, it looks like the developers made a good run, so everything is fine. I can only ask what I usually, or what the application usually is intended for. But maybe what's the actual outcome when we do something different, and maybe have something in place that would work as kind of a reverse shell uh, and get some deeper access to the application that we were just looking at. And to test something or get the application a bit tricked into it, I'm just using a little snippet, which begins as usual as large language models uh, would expect it to be, that it should calculate something and maybe to do some sophisticated stuff, please use the code and stuff that I'm just uh, appending to my request and then we see where we are coming to and what's going to be the end. Okay. Let's see. Now, ah, this somehow seemed to work. I guess that's not expected. So... Let's see. Hmm, okay. Suspicious, suspicious. Then let's do another trick. And for demo reasons, obviously, easy example. Maybe I want to get something down to the application. Then hmm, what do we have? File. We might have also downloaded here something. For the ones familiar with security, I guess the iCar test file or the signature is something you're all aware of. The nice virus that I just installed on the application um, for the demo reasons. And now the problem would be, hmm, who, uh, who fetches that? Who secures me from those kind of activities? And looking at it, oh, that was the wrong browser. Looking at this, yeah, the application here has some communication to the egress, to the uh, to the internal world. Then maybe we can revise its problems. Now, also, and this is a kind of difference, but what I wanted to point out, when we are looking at the possibilities that we have in the on-premise world, we obviously saw that there might be some issues inside the image. We might have some problems and so on and so forth. If we would go a bit deeper, and this is a kind of little sneak peek towards the SaaS version of Aqua, 
if we are looking at such AI workloads and going also in the shift left side, when we would be the persons or the enterprises actually developing that stuff, then we might also get some more information around it and on the configuration from it. Because then just looking at it here, we should see it somewhere in the list, if I'm not filtering wrong. Just using the free text form. Ah, there it is. Some container named AWS. It's the same results from the vulnerabilities for the image. Maybe he was uh, here, he already saw something, but this is what Aqua at the end is capable of when you have the full blown solution in place. So we wouldn't not only see here some incidents and cycling back to our actual on premise world demo application, we would see here the same that, oh, something, looking at the timestamp here, we had a detection from Aqua that was telling me, okay, this is actually a malware based on the test signature from the ICAR file that we saw that it was downloaded, that we also see that how someone might have evolved to getting this downloaded and down to my application. And we could also see here an action of block as i said we are not only here to detect we could also be established to prevent activities but as i want to also highlight that yeah, some restrictions or hesitations that still apply in the in the wild for ah i don't want to use agent-based solutions those bring down my applications uh this are to provide too much complexity and so on and so forth you don't need to go that deep or in that level the visibility might still be enough if you don't want to block the things, obviously I wouldn't recommend it for malware detections at least, but it's entirely up to you, even if you're a customer of such sophisticated runtime security tools for the cloud native world as Aqua can do. But now coming back to the full example, if we would have the information about the container in its build time, so the code repository, regardless of if the code repository is in GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, or if this code repository is located in the SaaS version of the ones I just mentioned, or if you also are more yeah, security-minded or compliance-minded and have your code base located on-premise, we could also scan those code repositories for the container image and then highlight to you exactly that we have some findings there, and those findings are also relevant for Gen AI. Um, activities and then we could also drill down into the findings what we've seen and we could have even uncovered and revealed those issues before someone uses this maliciously in your production environment this is more or less what yeah sums up that aqua is capable of regardless of having the access to the code base, using it on your own, and then also consuming the supply chain side, or if you are more the one just focusing on the runtime side, and then at least want to secure against those threats that were integrated inside of the application because someone didn't know exactly what he's actually doing, uh, what he was up for. And now coming back to the chromatic side of things, as we have now a finding, and this is some malware, which you could consider a bit of critical, you might want to reach out to your folks and reaching out to this could also be done via Aqua possibilities uh, when we would have not looked at the demo time for now, obviously, to maybe integrate this via webhook towards the notification channels and the alerting mechanisms as Tobias pointed out that are part already of the Kubernetes platform. Now I would just kindly say to him, hey, we had a malware issue in one of your clusters. So maybe you want to show us again how easy it would be to also eradicate everything that um, more or less was affiliated by that threat. If you want to. You're still on mute, maybe. Thanks for the hint. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you used the Aqua Demo Application Cluster, right? Exactly. OK. So basically, Dan, uh, basically we, we see, OK, we're using an old version. 
And you can also see it here in the node size. So we have basically a kernel version 5.4, what is really old. So basically um, you can trigger this also by automation, patching all clusters at once. Um, you can basically say, please change me the image. And that could be also triggered for the backend. Um, give me a reason one. So I go into the 24 um, version and say, okay. And now you see, how are we doing upgrades? And basically, we're not directly destroying here the node. We're basically saying um, we're creating a new one. Um, it's the same when we do updates. For example, I see, oh, Kubernetes 127. I should update this as well. I can say, please, I upgrade both to uh, already to 1.289 and upgrade all of the machines. So then I have new target. Remember, the intro for Kubernetes is a declarative way to get the state. And that's what we're doing with machines the same. So it's machine deployment is basically like a deployment of pods, just a deployment of machines. And we're managing here uh, the different machines. So in the machine deployments itself, so now we're relotating first the application server, but still I don't need to do something. I have reconciled in the end what bringing my application servers, what bringing my machines to the target state by the running workload. And um, that's basically then after, uh, um, yeah, after some time, your whole data center or your whole installation can reach the state. And then hopefully the warnings uh, would disappear and uh, your, your suspicious uh, service would be safe again. And that's basically how we think you can build up um, a global scaling application platform um, because it's not just like having detection, it's also to roll out such things. Basically, most of the exploits, I think, you also need to be aware that the infrastructure itself, like VMs or some, some patches, needs to get changed by chance really fast. And that's something what we try to solve. Um, so we try to solve to really be in place at every time uh, to upgrade also large scale environments. Okay, we see uh, this machine is starting um, and uh, this machines will be then uh, joining soon. And hopefully, uh, yeah, we can answer some questions until that time. And let's think we have um, still some time here. And we are ready for questions. Exactly. If there are any, I think from the chat voice, we had some. You don't need to be shy if this was a bit overloading at the end, obviously, understanding <laughs> multi cluster management and all of that alongside with some security capabilities that you can implement nicely and natively can be seen as a bit tedious, but it's hassle-free at the end. Yeah, for the slides, as uh, Kevin just asked, everything's going to be shared afterwards. Also recording, if you jump want to jump in to some point or they're like that's all gonna be published quite yeah, soon after we finished real quick here um guys there is a question in the q a someone asked uh, in the dashboard i saw a risk assessment can you please elaborate on the methodology and how to read those risks yeah the risk assessments um you want to share uh, I... Yeah, maybe let me just move back to it. Actually, looking at the, there's the share. Risk assessments, or do you mean risk explorer? Could also be, maybe. Um, so when it, when it comes to the methodology, what we are using when we are talking about the full-blown solution, we are checking the Kubernetes layer. Um, 
obviously when you're using Kubernetes, it's usually hassle-free uh, to be ensured that the Kubernetes is configured properly. But we are also looking from risk perspective into the vulnerabilities, into misconfigurations that were applied, into sensitive data that was found. Also, as I used the malware as an example here in the webinar, Aqua is also capable of providing signature-based malware detection on top of the plain uh, CVE uh, scanning that most of the um, solutions on the markets offer. And all of this is enumerated at the end towards risks. And when we are looking in the full-blown solution again, when it comes to uh, when it comes to full solution, then all of those informations like the ones I just explained from the workload protection, from scanning the images, but also the information is coming from the supply chain when we have the access towards your container image sources, like the actual application files and so on, if this would load now in my demo environment, is enumerated together and then being highlighted to you. And you can then freely decide how to work your way through it and maybe have some focus points because obviously, as Tobias mentioned by the Kubernetes platform, this is all backed by robust access control. So you usually are not overwhelmed with information like I am now here as the admin for the demo environment. You can always get the information specifically for the environments or for the images at the end or code repositories where you are responsible for or where you are working in. Yeah. If there's nothing else, okay. I would say thanks for your time, everyone, and attending. I hope we got you a nice overview around what Aqua can offer, around how you can integrate such a solution as Aqua into an existing or to be built Kubernetes environment. And wish you all the best. Anything from your and Tobias? No, just feel free to reach out at any time. And yeah. Yeah, contact <laughs> us and thanks for Thank your you. attention. Thank you.